So yeah. um, for all of the attendees who are here today, thank you so much for being here. It really, it really, really means a lot to all of us because I think this is a very exciting uh, topic and really exciting personally for me because uh, I am completely, absolutely don't know anything about the world of architecture, but I'm very grateful that I have good friends uh, that do know a lot about this and I, w and I was able to bring them here today. Um, I want to especially thank Salman for bringing Professor Ricardo, who doesn't like to be called Professor Ricardo, he likes he prefers Ricardo, so we're going to go with that today. But uh, yeah, thank you, Salman, for introducing me to uh, Ricardo. But one thing common for all of us is that we went to Northeastern. So Sara, Salman, uh, and I went to Northeastern for undergrad. And uh, Ricardo has been a visiting professor at Northeastern. So we share that in common. Um, and then um, Mo and I know each other through, uh, through a friend of us who's going to be on the panel, Sara. So that's really incredible as well. And he's part of my Bahrain family. And yeah. then I have a special relationship with Diana as well. Again, through a very dear friend of mine, uh, Chaitanya, who, and Diana has been around uh, over the last one, one and a half years. I've seen, uh, seen her a few times uh, as she's been working on the field in Jaisalmer um, as she's been building a school. But I think we're going to get into more, more of all of that in detail now. Um, so I think the best way to really kickstart this is, first of all, I want to say, um, again, thank you so much because over the last two weeks that this initiative has, oh, Sarah's here with us now. Fantastic. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, Sarah. Congrats on graduating. Yes. Yeah. Everyone. Oh, thank you so much. Huge congratulations it's, it's to very... She graduated last, uh, just yesterday uh, from her architecture, Masters in Architecture program from Columbia University. And uh, yeah, Sarah, do you want us to say a little something about that? How was your graduation? Um, sure, it was, it was very surreal. I mean, to graduate virtually on a computer. Um, I decided to take an RV and go around Utah while I was graduating. So it's, it's been, it's been a surreal, yeah, I mean, right, you go out, you go through seven years of, five years of undergrad, three years of a master's, might as well celebrate in the wilderness. You deserve it. You deserve Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Sarah, I was just telling everyone that you did your undergrad in Northeastern and how Salman, you and I share that and also Ricardo shares that. But uh, anyway, we're just going to, so I was saying I'm really grateful for everyone who's here. Thank you so much because we started this uh, initiative two weeks ago and over the last two weeks, we've hosted a couple, about three uh, round tables and everyone's been really intrigued by this uh, whatever strange concept if you may and it's working out really well for us because the idea is just and by us I mean me and a couple of my friends who advise me a lot and who are massive supporters and also um, my professor Kaleem Kamboj who's actually here um, listening and a huge shout out to him because He's been, a, he, he's been a huge advisor as I've started this. So um, it's anyway, so it's just a great, I'm, I'm really grateful. I'm going to end at that. But we're going to start with some introductions of all of you. Um, so I think I'd like to start with Ricardo, yet again, who doesn't like to be called Professor Ricardo, but he is a professor at Northeastern University as well as Kuwait University. But he's Very also cool. a practice, practicing uh, architect uh, in Lisbon and Kuwait. Um, and he will share more about that in detail. But he received his architecture degree from the Technical University of Lisbon, um, studied at Politecnico de Milano, um, and got and also at the Harvard, uh, Designs, uh, Harvard Design School. Uh, and also is at presently pursuing his uh, PhD at the University of Coimbra, Portugal. Sorry if I butchered all of those pronunciations. All good, all good, all good. 
Um, in the last two years, Ricardo has co-authored uh, various books, but most specifically the modern architect architecture of Kuwait, published by Negli, and is presently working on a future publication of ACTA on the Pan-Arabian modern architecture, which is going to be launched this year. Um, I'm going to move on to Dinah. Uh, Dinah, so Dinah has an interesting story. She went to Williams College for undergrad and then also, like a couple of you, went to Columbia University to pursue her master's in architecture. And right upon graduating, she established her own firm in 1992, which today is an award-winning firm that has worked primarily in high-end residential projects but has uh, over the last few years kind of switched focus on more non-profit initiatives um, and th that's how I met Dinah for everyone who just joined in uh, in Jessamere she's been developing uh, she's been building a very interesting school uh, with one of my dear friends Chatanya so she's going to talk more in detail about that but uh, and, and I'll let her get to it and then uh, my friend Salman, who I've known since freshman year of college, uh, he, he and I went to Northeastern together. He pursued his bachelor's, uh, bachelor's in architecture there and then went on to uh, pursue his master's in architecture uh, with a concentration in real estate from, uh, North, uh, from New York University. Uh, Salman is currently living in New York and is also in and has recently joined uh, the related companies which uh, re uh, related to design and construction team and has been working on uh, various sustainable urban revitalization projects in growing in metropolitan city cities and then there's Mo. Mo is, uh, is from Bahrain and he is an urban planner and a transportation planner who's, who's been working with the Bahrain uh, uh, Urban Planning Authority so he brings a very unique perspective into this panel tonight, but he pursued his uh, bachelor's in urban studies from the new school in New York, and then also pursued his master's in science in urban planning from Columbia, uh, like a couple of the panelists. And then finally, Sara. Sara pursued her bachelor's in architecture from Northeastern, and then just yesterday, has graduated from Columbia University with her master's. Before this, she's worked a lot in the Middle East and her, her previous work experiences involved in the design and development of a museum in Riyadh's al Diria district, as well as um, Studio Chatterella in Rome, Italy. So, um, and in addition to this, she's been involved in the design of various nonprofit hospitals in the African continent with a firm called AR, ARC IDC in Lisbon, Portugal. So Ricardo and Sara share that in common as well. So that's, the, that's, that's, that's our excellent panel here today. So I'm going to ask you all to share a few words or share whatever you'd like to about your philosophy of work, what, what matters to you most uh, as a part of your introduction and um, Ricardo, we can start with you. I think that would be best. Thank you. I would like first to, to thank you. And it's, of course, a pleasure to be here with so many great people. Um, and uh, I, think, I think it's a very interesting mo moment because this sort of uh, interactions allow to cross barriers of physical space in, in, in roundtables and discussions that would just play a role on a physical space so it's, it's great that we are here it's also great this generational uh, cross I would be more willing to hear rather than talking uh, I think I think at certain point uh, that's exactly one moment that is being very very critical and one of the main discussions at the moment if you want me to tell just something about what's going on in Porto at least at the moment one of the big discussions is the difference between older and younger in the relation of confinement. So there has been a big discussion about uh, some sort of uh, unfairness regarding confinement among young people, especially we are talking about uh, people that are starting their lives. They have lower economical resources than older ones. 
Uh, so it's, it's been a big, big subject of discussion. Uh, also, uh, the relevance of younger people to energize and keep going on uh, an economy, uh, which, which has been also uh, quietly um, fragilized with this process. So I, I, I think that I would, I'd really like to hear what the, the younger ones in the panel have to say about your energy and your reaction to the moment because we don't want you to get lazy on the sofa and, and just watching. We want you to take action with this. Yeah, we yeah, we are all, I think there's so many changes happening in every industry right now. And I think, uh, so that's why it's very important to have these kind of discussions. So it's, it's great that we're all here. But uh, Diana, do you wanna go next to share a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I am actually the, the um, oldest here, I think. I graduated from Columbia 30 years ago, which is shocking. I'm actually supposed to do a reunion call in, like tonight. Um, and the funny irony is just some of the things that I was thinking about my last years of Columbia, I'm now redoing in my projects. That I, uh, I'm doing a project in Nepal, I'm doing a, a, a school. And um, I had started working on spaces that were healing, spaces that related to sacred geometries that um, kind of resonate with your deepest memories and spaces that were more, less about what, what it looked like, but more about healing, more about how the visceral responses to spaces were. So in fact, this, um, this pandemic actually is creating a shift that is like almost in line with what I have been thinking and doing. And um, I, I actually, it, despite how horrible and sad it has been, I actually think that there's a lot of optimism and a lot of possibility for change and growth and, you know, mainly to sort of uh, shift the economic disparity, I think would be one of the main things that we, in my work, I'm right now trying to focus on. So um, I'm trying to, and actually through the technologies in some ways with this weird world that we're in, we're making very direct connections between the communities in India and Nepal I'm working with and the communities in the United States. So hopefully that will continue. Yeah, hopefully that will. I think that, I mean, anyway. Um, Mo, Mo, would you like to go next and share a little bit about yourself as well? Sure, sure. sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, again, Val, thank you for organizing this. It's good to see old friends and meet new people. Um, I actually started as a politics major. Um, I, I, like, it, I didn't I, know I, that. Yeah, I did. I was, I'm very, I love history. I love, I'm, and I'm interested in government but th that was honestly the most depressing two years of my life. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and anyone who knows me, like I'm a huge transportation nerd. I can show you my mini airplane. <laughs> uh, as it can, and it didn't change. And uh, I just remember one time, one of my advisors it was like, ever since you started college, you've, all you've been taking is politics classes. Like, I, um, I won't accept you taking one more change. And I was, as I was looking through the catalog, I just came across that city and transportation. And I honestly didn't take it seriously in the beginning. I just thought this was just gonna be a fun class. I didn't know that urban planning and sustainability was a huge field. So overnight, I was like, bye politics, left it in the trash, and changed my major and the rest was history. Um, despite like not enjoying my first two years, my, uh, in school at least, I loved living in New York City. I loved being in a huge urban environment. My favorite thing about being in the city is just I can walk out my building and there's endless things to do. And that's the thing I, I love most is that you don't have to have a plan or an agenda. You just walk out your building and the city will take you where, to wherever. Uh, and coming back here, we live, unfortunately, in a very, very car-centric society where you can't. Like, it's a very, very risky thing to do to walk on the streets because a lot of streets don't have sidewalks. So you do have things like uh, pedestrian accidents. 
um, and, and children getting hit by cars while they're on their bikes. So it's really tragic. But I just want to echo what Diana said. And it's, it is a moment of opportunity because among the things that are happening right now with the pandemic is that they've shut down all the gyms. And all of a sudden, like all the country now own a bike. They're walking on the streets. It literally looks like Amsterdam right now when you go out. Everyone's on their bike. Everyone's walking out. So it is an opportunity for change. Um, and there was a kind of notion that I didn't like it before. of like, oh, people here don't walk. People here don't like to use their bikes. And now seeing literally have the country on the streets on bikes and walking, it's, it's kind of an eye-opening opportunity to see like things can change. People do want this if they have a safe and reliable infrastructure to support that. So that is my spiel. No, I, I've always known you're very passionate about the way people uh, people communicate and travel within cities. So that's really, I think you bring a very unique perspective into this discussion uh, from the point of view of how people are going to have to change their behaviors. So we're, we're going to get into more, more details of that as well. But uh, Sarah, you just graduated. Tell us a little bit about yourself and... Uh, and yeah, how does it feel to just graduate yesterday and, and what have you been involved in? Um, so first off, thank you for having me. It's, it's very exciting to be part of a conversation a day after graduating and the feeling that, you know, the, the loss of graduate school is the loss of intellectual space and ever since you know my last studio class I've just been you know researching and collecting pdfs and books and things that can continue my thrill for being Diana about the revelations that came to you in graduate school and how they came back into your practice after such a long time that that for me is a very interesting and provocative statement, this relationship between education and practice. Um, so I should, as for um, the pandemic, I think, I think generally it's very, it's very hard to predict our personal or global in scale. Um, but I'll say if I personally have um, an instinctual hope for how this pandemic may change the world, it would be in the ways that we use material, you know, and the substance that makes our architecture. And by that, I mean, you know, um, whether it's like communities in Nepal or communities in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, we, we have material substance around us and due to globalization and due to mass production, we have split from that. So maybe these, uh, maybe the pandemic will reveal ways of construction. And I think that's an interesting um, conversation to maybe possibly have somewhere along the way. Yeah, so I'm gonna tell everybody, so Sara has always been a massive, uh, you know, she's been this adventurous person. So as you can tell, there's a brick wall behind her right now. But as we speak, she's actually in the middle of an RV. So I'm sure a lot of you heard her speaking with this like echoing voice. So we're just gonna, we're gonna deal with that, this conversation, because we're very grateful that she's making it. But Tara, your voice was breaking a lot in the middle of that, but we're still so happy that you're here. And uh, I hope, we, you're going to be able to show us where you're really at, but maybe we'll leave that for the end. So Salman, finally, uh, I'd like for you to share a little bit about yourself and what you've been up to. And I know you're in Riyadh right now, but you work in New York. So just uh, tell, us, uh, tell us about yourself as well. Okay. The way I found myself into architecture was, you know, you have to always go to the root of it. I've always been creative. So I was told and I was always inspired to be surrounded by creative people. And I ended up, I like to draw and I like to create. So I had to turn a draw, uh, a stroke of the pen into reality. So I ended up in architecture. And I was very lucky to be surrounded by very educated professors 
in a very um, in a very uh, knowledge based city like Boston. And uh, by the time I graduated, I asked myself a very important question: is how can you create architecture as an architect without being constrained by the financial and political and all these risks that constrain you, that divert you as an architect, that you produce something that you don't want to produce just for the sake of it. So I, I, I said to myself, in the world that we live in, we need to understand how do buildings come into reality. And these ha this happens with real estate developers. And me coming fr from, from uh, like as a son of a, of a very, um, very uh, strict businessman, I said, okay, let me understand the business of architecture and buildings. So that's how I ended up doing my second master's degree in real estate development at NYU in New York. And I realized and I was, and it was very uh, apparent to me that for a building to be materialized and constructed, it needs to be to its highest and best use where it has to be physically possible first, not crazy shapes of architecture that are not physically even possible. They need to be polit politically sound. They need to be financially, maximizing the financial of the project and they need to be environmentally friendly. So from that aspect, you, you understand how architecture and real estate development and how architecture come to a marriage and how real, real estate and architecture is, is born. So without, without architecture being sound economically and uh, in terms of uh, benefits to the society, architecture will never be realized. So this is where I am now. And uh, when, when we talk more, a little bit more, I will refer to projects that I worked in and experiences that I that I, that I that I that I had in the past. Sorry, I was muted. But yeah, um, thanks so so much, Salman, for that. Um, on on one particular note of what you said about having very excellent professors and knowledge from them, I just want to do one last shout out because I know there is cup there's a couple of professors who are listening to us today and. One of them is a very dear mentor of mine, uh, who is a lifetime mentor for me, is Mark Bernfeld, who's here listening, as well as Salman, your professor, Manish Shrivasa. So we're very grateful that you've taken the time out to listen into this conversation and we'll stop there. But I think from all of, uh, for, for, from like, the, the most interesting thing about today's discussion is that all uh, five of you bring very diverse perspectives because I mean, all six of us are in six different countries, right, as we speak. Uh, Ricardo is in Portugal. Salman, you are in Saudi right now. Uh, Dinah, you're in Rhode Island. Sara, you're in some, somewhere in California. And, uh, and Mo, you're in Bahrain, and I'm in India. So that's, like, that's a very diverse group of uh, people we've already got here. So I would love to get into various things. And I think today's conversation, yes, uh, we spent about a half hour in the introduction itself, but we are going to dive, uh, dive slightly deeply into various ways that the role of architecture is, is very deep in the way we interact with communities, in the way um, uh, the, the, the role of architecture in like pub public policy, uh, the role of architecture, how in past pandemics, how architecture has really evolved the way and evolved and moved things forward. So we're going to get into all of these things, the role of architecture and human behavior, mental health, all of these various different concepts. So uh, we're going to get into all of that. So, um, so I just wanted everybody to know it's going to be, uh, we, we'll still only be scratching the surface, but I hope we have a meaningful discussion and, then, and that all of us are able to learn as much as possible. So I would present a very layman's perspective, asking you all of you these questions. And Ricardo is going to chime in wherever I struggle, and whenever, and he's going to help me frame the discussion and really get the most out of all of our panelists tonight. So uh, thank you so much for that, Ricardo. But I would really like to start with keeping in mind that we are in this very unique situation, being in the middle of a pandemic, something that we're all facing at the same time in different geographies, in different countries. I would really like to understand what is it, um, because you're in all these different uh, different places, how is it that you've noticed that architecture and urban planning has changed in your present day and how you predict it within the city that you're in right now? How is it going to change, um, how is it going to change 
in the near future as well as what your predictions are for it in uh, going forward. But before I do that, I'm going to also allow Ricardo to say, uh, to, to chime in and, and say something if he'd like to. Uh, thank you. I, I will try. I will try. But, <laughs> but, but I, think, I think here the, 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 strong, the strong discussion is more, as I said, as each one of us reacts to the moment, either intellectually, either pragmatically, being active and being part of, of a community, which I'm sure faces different challenges where each one of us is at the moment. Uh, I, I would say that uh, it would be very interesting at this point um, to understand those uh, specificities. So I think it would be great to, to, to know a little bit of each one of, of the ones in the panel, uh, how their communities are reacting to this situation, how they see the ability of, of architects and urban planners, more than architecture and urban planners, in, in voicing towards their community and taking part. I'm imagining that Diana has ideas about how healthcare and hospital environments uh, are evolving all around the East Coast, not only in Rhode Island, but or not only in Providence, but I imagine that New York and Boston. Um, and on the other hand, also how Salman and, uh, and Mohammed, for example, uh, are seeing at the moment the relation with expats and migration, which I think is a challenge in the region. So since, uh, since we are talking around the Gulf, uh, I, just, I just found out that 1.8 million Indians uh, were moved from, from the Middle East into India. Uh, so this sort of, of process, I'm sure, brings uh, challenges that an architect and an urban uh, planner care about uh, in both places. So either in India, either in, in the Middle East. And then uh, I, I just, uh, one, one interesting thing is the fact that uh, Sara being in a very lifestyle, relaxed environment in, in the West Coast, so California, which is eventually very similar to where I am now in terms of mood with the kids playing outside. And it, it's a slightly uh, uh, disconnected to those problems I was talking more evident in the Middle East. So you being someone uh, from the region and being in such an environment, what do you collect from that? Because one, one of the issues that everybody keeps talking about during these days is how life is important and how lifestyle is important and how that should be prevailing um, on top of economy, on top of all the capital discussions and the global connections that Sato was mentioning that somehow uniformized the life standards of everybody everywhere in the world. So I think that that would be my, my input for this kickoff for each one of you. We, we, can, start, we can start with Sato. Sure. Um, so can you just reiterate your question in terms of, are you the lifestyle? Yeah, so, so basically you being an architect and uh, somehow having an experience of working in different environments, how you do perceive this ambition of achieving a certain lifestyle? You know, ma many times we are talking, and Mohammed was very clear about that stating the importance of the closure of the gyms, which of course will have an economical impact in Manama, I imagine, uh, but how that is important to make people happier and, and how you as an architect or an urban planner should be a voice of that in a way. You should, should have an agency towards the, the, the mental health, yeah. the, good, yeah, the good of all, and I how you challenge that with politics yeah. and economics as Salman meant. I think the, the interesting part is that despite a person being in California, I was also in Joshua Tree for uh, two months. I basically escaped um, the crisis in New York by going to Joshua Tree. And especially at a moment where anxiety is very high, it is very hard to escape reality. I think that was a very true fact, um, was apparent. I think one thing that I, you know, um, have recognized is the idea of what the pandemic is doing in the Bronx versus what the pandemic is doing in my neighborhood, which is West Village. 
what is the pandemic doing in Mecca versus what is the pandemic doing in Riyadh? So, and I think throughout history, there has always been a relationship between, rather than like architecture and uh, pandemics, it's always been a relationship between policy and pandemics, which by virtue of that give birth to an architecture that is more cohesive and conducive to lifestyles that are supportive of well-being, lighting conditions, um, material use, whether it's like we're, we're listening in like, okay, plastics are not good for virus, for viruses, they're very contagious. Will this affect mass production? Will this change the material that most of our products are made of? I think that, and that is birthed in policy. I think that could be an interesting space. Thank you, thank you. Mohammed, what, what would you have to complement beyond this material condition that Sara was, was referring to? Um, as you briefly mentioned, actually, about the situation here is, is um, Bahrain is now what? How many active cases do we have? Oh, close to 4,000. Um, that might seem a little compared to a lot of big countries, but we are ranked, I think, the fifth or fourth densest country in the world right now. And that is mostly because of the migrant workers that come here. And as we see, because of the unfortunate language that comes mostly from the United States and certain politicians there, there needs to be a certain understanding of why there's the, there are certain um, why cases are the way they are right now. In Bahrain, for example, the biggest portion of the population who are infected by the virus are migrant workers. Why? The lot of people will be like, oh no, there's a lot of them. It's a really bad thing that we have migrant workers, but it's not. If you actually look deep into it and look at the main things that where they live, it's, it's, it's very inhumane and sad by how a lot of them are treated, especially in the construction industry where a lot of migrant workers are uh, forced to live with each other in small apartments with eight to ten people in a small apartment who all share a single bathroom and if it takes one person to be sick to infect the entire building so and people think of that oh it's, that's their fault it's not it's the people it's the companies and the individuals who allowed them to be in the certain situation so and and it's 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 there are laws preventing that, but it's, it's very loosely enforced. And it's now that the government is like, okay, this is kind of what's causing this mess right now. So a lot of construction companies right now have their eye, like uh, have a spotlight on them for being a catalyst for spreading this disease. So it's, it's very important to Think of language, but mostly education, and educate yourself of, of why certain things are the way they are. Mohammed, you, you just mentioned the construction environment, uh, and, and I was just uh, wondering and listening to the introduction of Diana, uh, that she was mentioning that somehow uh, this period is helping her to revisit uh, the conception of a design process. And, and I think one of the key issues here is it's always easy for us, as I mentioned in the beginning, as designers, to stay, to set back and to say, we have nothing to do with this. This is uh, the fault of the construction company. This is the fault of the government, the policies and all that. So somehow, and, and taking on Sara uh, reference to the fact that pandemics are always an opportunity to, to change things. Do you think, Diana, that some of the understanding of process of design through construction process is it might be something occurring so we might be uh, as designers able to design first the construction the logistics the resources the materials rather than the poetics of the space um i, I mean that's a big question so um the <laughs> I think actually as architects, that's actually the most important thing. I think that the poetics of the space is a luxury that we have. And I think that um, one of the things that is very profound about this pandemic is that it is affecting the less fortunate. And 
you know, I live in New York City. I'm in Rhode Island because I, I mean, I'm in Rhode Island because I have the luxury to be able to get a second home. And it's, uh, it's the less fortunate that are actually the most impacted like the migrant workers, and I'm following the migrant workers in, in India a uh, lot. Um, and I, um, yeah, I, sorry, what was the first question? <laughs> no, I, I basically mentioned that somehow, uh, many times it happens that we as designers, we retain ourselves from investing on the construction process as part of our impact on a certain space, on a certain community. And, and, and all that Mohammed was talking about was somehow a frame, a context where we have something to say, as well as what Sara was mentioning regarding material conditions. Well, I mean, I think that's like the essence of actually the work that I have been doing in both India and Nepal. It's like, you know, Americans love talking about sustainability. So many Americans are sort of they will, they will donate to my project if it's sustainable. And I'm, it's just the most ridiculous question because I'm in Jaisamir, in India. Our materials are coming from five miles away, just by necessity. I'm doing a nonprofit school. Every move I make has to be justified. Every move cannot be for some design whimsy that I have. It has to, it has to have a, a function but to me, I also feel like it has to have an essence of transformation and beauty. So otherwise, why, why bother? Why not? Why would I be there? It has to, I'm an architect. That's the, the, the gift, whatever it is that I have. And so it has to transform from just the utility. But it, you cannot negate the importance of just really how is this going to be made? And how am I going to convey to people who speak a different language, who are from a different culture, how should this be made? And it's the most important part. On the other hand, like our job, I think, as architects is to then take that, to take the materials and to elevate to something else. And I have to say the thing that's the most profound for me um, having worked in high-end residential in New York and done some commercial projects and community projects, the thing that I take away from the Nepal and the India projects is they live in incredibly harsh climates. So the necessity for materials um, is just very basic. Like, for example, I'm on a deadline for the project in Nepal and I have to get my timber order in because they are actually moving from Simico to Halji today. And I have to tell them how many timbers they will cut down on their way to bring to the school because we only have four months to do this work. And we're working very hard because they're actually they're, you know, have limited resources, they're hungry, and we want to keep, get the school done because it would be uplifting for them. And we're also working on other ways to provide them with funding, um, buying yak blankets for carpets and stuff, to connect, connecting them directly to uh, users, I mean, to, to buyers in the United States. But um, I guess they're, in these countries, there's um, an essence of economy that we as Americans um, just don't have the luxury of not actually ever having to think about. Um, oh, yeah, no. We have, yeah. No, no, no. F thank you. I think I think that that was exactly what uh, we were mentioning. I, I would just um, take the opportunity to move into Salman because at a certain point you are talking about something which is a very clear and much clear discourse for developers and, and contractors. And what is, what is interesting here is the fact that you are talking about a knowledge that you acquire by means of need that might have an impact in places where those means are different. And, and I, think, I think that at a certain point in the world we live today in this pandemic state of emergency, uh, the, the geographical movement 
uh, it's something, as Sarah was mentioning in the beginning, that somehow um, decreases the speed of globalization in a way. So it's, it's less easier and that brings problems into goods and materials to move from one place to the other. And I think this is something that developers have been thinking about for a long time, uh, basically because they have moments in market for a certain sale or for a certain product. And, and I think New York is quite particular in that intensity. So the city is moving around those waves. So I, I would just uh, stop you here and we will come back to that and move into Salman. And, and basically, uh, Salman would be interesting to understand how this sort of responsibility that the real estate has in defining a new, uh, a completely new order to the construction industry might have an impact in a region where manufacturing is not being uh, the major source of investment. Uh, so the idea of diversifying an economy, is this an opportunity for Saudi Arabia, for the kingdom, as you mentioned, to diversify the economy? Oh, sorry. Well, well I, believe, I believe that we are now in survival mode. The pandemic is still going on. Everybody is in a shock. We're still in survival mode and we're gathering together and trying to think to, sur to survive this thing. This is number one. This is important to highlight. The future is still ambiguous, but we see hope. So by catching, with that, by catching that thread of hope, we are thinking about designing to, or thinking about as planners and architects to prevent that thing. Now, how is this pandemic gonna change the future and how us as architects in terms of thinking in a sustainable manner, thinking how will this change the economy and thinking how the, the future will, will look like, we need to understand that th this pandemic had, has happened in the past and we overcame it. And there is a huge probability and there is a very, from the, from the facts that we see that we will pass this. So what this pandemic will do is that number one, it, what I believe is that it will accelerate existing trends we were already going through an economic transformation. We were already getting rid of fossil fuel. We were already reducing carbon emissions. We were already reducing office space in the real estate market. We were doing a lot of things, but we were going to that direction at a certain pace. Post COVID-19, in my opinion, will accelerate these things that we have. In addition, that it will remove certain programs that were already dying, let's say like retail, to an extent, because we still need a little interaction, and it will accelerate a new transformative economy. So, Salman, I just think that that uh, discussion on retail is, is a good subject for uh, Valabi. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name well. Salman, yes. Yeah. No, no, Valabi, Valabi, not Salman. Oh, Valabi. Salman, Valabi. I know. <laughs> Valabi. Uh, uh, I think that, that would be a good, a good subject the retail it might be one of those spaces where yes. changes are already quite predictable, at least for the near future. Yes, uh, but this, this is Professor, what I meant that this is one thing that was already happening and now it's accelerating so fast. Another example is common space, let's say in residential, luxury residential areas where you have kids room. Do people want to send their kids between each other and play? while there is a possibility that this virus still exists, what if we eradicate this virus? Do pe are people gonna feel okay sending their kids playing together in that program in this luxury residential? Uh, but, but, that's, but, that's, but that's, you need to count also on solidarity between people and trust, which, 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 are, which are means that I think get on another level now. And, and especially in the kingdom, might need to go outside the family or the or, or the close family uh, context, yes. you know, because we are talking about uh, human structures that still very very intrinsical uh, in in their own understanding of family, and yes. and and I think at a certain point this idea of urbanization and the idea of living in a city uh, is something that I think Valabi has has something to say to to yeah. move on. Yes. Yeah, no, I think, uh, thank you, Ricardo. I think you, you, I know you mentioned retail, but I would actually even go a little bit more, I take a step back, honestly, um, because from, from, I think something that laymen like me and a lot of the attendees were 
or just listening in a, on this conversation, uh, not from the from the architecture world. We, we sometimes forget the effects of urbanization um, and the effects of them, uh, of, of that entire concept within our day-to-day -day lives, um, how it's affecting our society, how it's affecting our culture, how it's affecting the way we live. Um, and I think, um, I think something, Ricardo, that you mentioned when we were speaking uh, in preparation for this conversation was that about half of the population of this entire world is is um, only living on one percent of surface area. Two percent. Two percent. Two percent of the planet of planet Earth. Yeah, and that's that's a very that's a crazy statistic from for, for me personally. So I think about that, and that's why Mo, uh, considering that you're working very closely with the the government of Bahrain and working as an urban planner, that's where your degree is. You know, that's what what you've studied really, essentially, and you're very passionate about. And I also know that as I ask you this question, I know it's going to take you off. So. <laughs> I, I keeping all of keeping yeah. that in mind for everybody. I want to ask you. You know, there is a huge disproportion in the urban and rural spaces globally. Cities and city living create various challenges in the way societies and environments interact with each other. Um, so, given that you're working in this space, can you tell us a little bit about what's your perspective on this whole? Do you see this as a problem? And if you do, what is the problem? And just share your thoughts on it and help us understand how is it that cities can retain a natural connection to the environment while continuing to you know thrive i was messaging you earlier but i told you whoever wrote that question is gonna want to fight with me eventually yeah uh, um, i'm gonna take steps way 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 back and i think there are three pillars to seriously flatten the curve and to prevent future pandemics from ever happening or happening at a catastrophic uh, catastrophic rate. And that's education, not tampering with nature, and hygiene. The main three things, education by means of what's the root of this? What's the serious root? Not by blaming countries or certain uh, cultures. It's blaming the root cause of things and, and how can we can prevent it. Uh, not tampering with nature. That's the, the number one reason why urbanization is actually good. Because the more people use less space on earth, the more we are stuck together and we let nature do its thing and, and not ruin it, not pollute it. We're actually doing much more good, especially if we introduce things such as sustainable energy to not make the air so dirty. Um, the more people actually like the more sprawl there is and the more suburbanization there is, the more there's going to be need to build more roads, the more cars there's going to be need to, to, to drive and, and pollute the air. So by making, by urbanizing and, and keeping people within a contained space, you can make people walk instead, use public transportation instead. That leaves a much smaller uh, carbon footprint. Um, and it's, it's, this is history repeating itself over, over and over again. With the Black Death, it was the main cause of the spread of, of, of that disease was fleas, which could have easily been prevented had people, you know, have been had more access to uh, 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 hygienic products and showers. But of course, that those were different times, and, and there was lots of people who couldn't afford it or didn't have that luxury. Um, education again played a role in the cholera disease in London. Um, where it was where people thought for the longest time it was an airborne disease, but John Snow said no, it was actually waterborne disease. Um, and then we moved to COVID-19, which scientists are proving to be uh, have been discussing how it come from bats. So the main three pillars keep repeating itself over and over again. So the more we come to realize that, the more cities can actually actually be a haven, an oasis for for sustainable human development. Um, no, no, I think those are really great points. I think what you really highlighted over there is that pandemics have somehow really evolved architecture forward. I think uh, ever since uh, 14th century, I was doing some research into this conversation before I, you know, I start asking you these questions. And I, and I came across, you know, there was a bubonic 
plague in the 14th century that led to a lot of transform transformation within the urban space. And then also there was the yellow fever uh, in the, and smallpox in the 18th uh, century that led to lots of citywide sewer system, plumbing, disease mapping, all of these different innovations that happened. And then in the 20th century, there was the tuberculosis, Spanish flu, uh, and polio, which really led to um, the clearance of slums and the waste management systems coming into place. So there was lots of different, in, in, a, in a way, a lot of these pandemics have really shaped and evolved architecture forward. So, I mean, keeping that in mind, I think I would like to really ask, uh, I, I would understand like, you know, the, the, one of the biggest problems that we are facing is that there is rapid, the population is increasing at a rapid level. So I think at this point, I would really like to bring you back in, Diana, and ask you, um, what is this continuous increase in the world's population and unequal distribution that's happening between geographies and between cities and countryside? Um, for, according to you, how do you really uh, tackle the problem? And what are your thoughts on this whole concept of, you know, 2% of urban and like urban urbanization and cities are on 2% of the planet like that to me that's a very crazy concept and the thought is just uh, yeah so I want to hear your thoughts on that um tell me the first part of the question sorry you just said I I was I was wondering like with the increase in population affecting a lot of the ch the, the the challenges we're facing due to urbanization and with the fact that there's only two percent like 98 percent of earth is not urban so well, how can you navigate these changes with um you, you know with how, how do you really navigate these changes when and ricardo would you like Valavi, to can can i just add here something i think this is where diana was before i interrupt her so <laughs> because at a certain point at a certain point what muhammad is saying uh, of course it has a sense but on the other hand, the big challenge is that we are not as fast as the population is growing. So we are not as fast uh, being able to produce these cities and these environments, these oases, as Mohammed said, at, at the speed population is increasing. So in places like India and Nepal, where Diana is working, the challenge is how can you bring the oases into remote areas where this sort of people are spreading? Or, well, or where people that live outside the cities are spreading. I mean, I think what Mohammed said was incredibly interesting. I've lived in New York for a very long time, and I think the density, and I think that the street life and that interaction uh, is just, you know, part of the magic of why we all go to these places. I think my now experience going to India, where you know I actually walk on the streets in Mumbai and Delhi, and I say to my friends that I walked there, and they're just astounded because they don't walk anywhere. It's just not, it's not comfortable. And it's just, I mean, it would be a very interesting idea that while nobody's on the streets, if that these cities in India or across the globe actually went out and cleaned them because, or set up sidewalks or, you know, made it so that there was that sense of, of urbanism. And I, and I understand the place where it comes from in India, where you had to, the cities weren't safe. So you had to create sort of walls around your spaces. But I think that that's, the cities are probably safer. So that can be relaxed. Um, but I also think just in general, having lived in New York for a long time, I actually think that people will start to move away from the cities. I think that they will, yeah, one of the things that I keep talking to people about is like how important sort of community is and how important sort of regionalism is and how important it is for us to connect to our local food sources and um i mean i see it very pr prominently in in india and it's one of the things that in the organization i'm working with is trying to facilitate is to sort of keep the 
craftspeople from migrating to the cities, but to actually have a place for them in their, in their communities so that they don't, they don't, it doesn't sort of just keep these families apart. And like right now, the problem in India is all of the migrant workers are there. And when they are released, they don't know what will happen when they go back to their cities. And so, I mean, on a very small, very little way, we're trying to create um, opportunities for the people in their region to work and to actually then sell their work either to foreign markets. Um, Cause for some reason that hasn't really happened. Yeah. Um, I, so. I think Dinah, what you're talking about, you, I, I think a lot of what you're talking about is really the role of uh, design and architecture in uh, shaping human uh, behavior, to be honest. I, I think so because um, it's, it's like somehow I, you're talking more at a grassroots level with the crafts communities, etc., which is really interesting, and I want you to get into get more into that. Also, um, just taking a step back, at, uh, also I think design and architecture play a huge role in even all of the people who are attending this conversation and myself. It, I think the way spaces are designed around us plays an impact, important role in how productive we are in affecting our mood. Um, so I would want to trans, uh, sort of move our conversation into really discussing the role of architecture and how all of us as a humanity in, interact with it. Because sometimes we forget about uh, the the massive role architecture plays and i think my personal respect for this field has increased after conversing with ricardo and personally i wish i studied in some ways i actually wish i studied architecture it's like a whole uh, it's a whole spiel of uh, like a eight-year program that you have to go into so i'm like maybe i won't wish it for myself but i really envy all of you who've really gone into the you know the studies of all of this because it's fascinating I find it fascinating. I can't speak for everybody else, but so yeah. So I really want to um, talk about that, really, how it's affecting human behavior per se. And Diana, actually, I'll come back to you um, on that. So you have transitioned from working in a very different environment. You've been in the New York luxury, high-end residential space. And then I don't know what it was that made you, I mean, I think you briefly <laughs> talked about what it was, but. Maybe you can share with everybody as well um, a few minutes on how, why, why did you transition from that space into the space you're working in right now, which is in India and Nepal and in Jaisalmer and building these community nonprofit initiatives. And uh, yeah, what, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you speak to that. Just give us some insight into your design sensibilities and th thought process as you design for these different landscapes. Um. It's, I think in some ways it was sort of like everything it sort of just happened and I actually had reached a saturation point with the high end residential and so I took a course on social economic and environmental design which didn't lead to much but um, then I met the, the head of this organization who is brilliant Michael Dabe from Chita and he does these projects and um, I just realized that as architects, we have a gift that we can share with the world. And it's, it was just, uh, I could have a more profound effect in these communities than I could with people who I was doing the work for. So, um, and I think that the thing that I brought more was that I, I know a lot of what, I mean, I've been studying this for a long time and a lot of Westerners go to these communities and feel that they actually know the answers and then impose their answers on these communities and they actually don't really have any idea at all. And I think that that's the, the reward and that's what I've learned is that there's an exchange between the cultures that is phenomenally rewarding I mean, for me, and hopefully in the end for them as well, because 
I think we have so much to learn from cultures that don't commodify everything and don't move as quickly and aren't as uh, focused on wealth and uh, it, your identity through your space. And so, um, I don't know, I've just, I've, I've learned a great deal and um, uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure how. <laughs> no, I think, I think uh, at this point, it would, Salman, even you, you're working at Related, which is, um, which I'm very familiar with personally. So maybe you also give us a little bit of background on to what Related is, because I, um, I have, yeah, so I'm sure everyone doesn't really know what that is. So yeah, in your experience, yeah, tell us, tell us uh, more about Related. So, related is a global company. Yeah. They have more than three to 4,000 employees. They have uh, real estate assets of more than $90 billion, and they are a private health company. So they're a, they're a huge entity that affect uh, social structures and architecture and buildings and cities in the world. So we cannot deny that, okay? But I want to also relate with the idea of related and buildings and producing buildings in cities with the idea of Diana and how it ties back to, to sustainability. At that scale and at the scale of cities and at the scale when you want to build community that affects people, sustainability means that if your design approach doesn't add value and, re and reduce the cost, if your sustainability doesn't reduce cost, reduce carbon emissions, and therefore raise the value of the building, it will not happen. Unless if you want to build a shed in, in a very far area for you to live in and detach yourself from the world. So we need to come from that approach. This pandemic has hit everybody. As a result, everybody will start thinking now and our natural instinct that made us human beings live for thousands and thousands of years to survive, it will kick in to say, okay, how can we design architecture that is really sustainable and save us money and just in case we will never forget that the pandemic hit because we're in a global level we cannot say we're going to shut the us forever or we're going to shut china forever now we or saudi forever this cannot happen we are global human being we survive as our natural instinct we are social in our, our natural instinct so how can we as human beings to the fullest to, to the farthest extent that we can do how can we put each other, put our hands with each other and start thinking, okay, what is truly sustainable? If this hits again. But, and but I Salman, think, Salman, sorry to interrupt you. Yes. But, but what do you think is a call for solidarity in a sense? Because what Diana is also talking about is about the call from her role as a designer to yes. contribute in another environment. And I, think, and I think that goes into what you were saying Yes. And, and somehow it, it stays beyond the idea of economical sustainability. So we are talking about community and social sustainability, which goes back to the idea of the city as an oasis that Mohammed was talking about, mm -hmm. in a way, which, which is, again, a very critical subject, specifically in the region where you guys are coming from, in the Middle East. Yes, I think, I think Diana, from the, way she, from the, way, like the introduction that I know, and what I read about her and the way she talked about sustainability, she's a true person that cares about building a sustainable uh, environment that will help one another. So in order, we, education is important. Education for people to understand what is sustainability. Are we getting rid of, are the corporate uh, plastic uh, companies getting rid of plastic spoons just for the sake, because they find a cheaper biodegradable product that they can profit more? Or are they really getting rid of it because they realize another thing that is as big as coronavirus is going to hit soon and we need to work on it. So in order to widen our knowledge and try to spread the message as, as much as possible, to raise the awareness of people, to understand that this is a threat and the natural instinct of human being will come to front and will cause that solidarity. So us as people that realize that danger, we can do it and we can raise awareness to it that what we are doing right now. Well, I think you're talking about doing it in New York City, which is like an incredibly complicated overlay yes. of the yes. system. And, and I, 
I, I have to agree with you, Diana. I have to agree because New York City is the most dense city in the world. And us architects, we know Edward Glazer's point of view and we know Jane Jacobs' point of view. And for those who don't know, Edward Glazer, Edward Glazer is New York, is all buildings, and Jane Jacobs is parks and short buildings. So these two um, uh, op opposite views. So in New York City, if you lock yourself in your apartment in a more serious pandemic, where things are more fatal, you will not leave your house at all, regardless of the situation where you are but, living. But in Saman, Saman, sorry to interrupt you. The question is that is not everybody living in an apartment in Manhattan. And that's, I think, at a certain point, what we are talking about here, and when we talk about densier cities, yes. if we go to Mumbai, or if we go to Cairo, or, or if we go to, I don't know, Beijing, or, or, or Lagos in Nigeria, these are the spaces where we, as designers, have responsibilities. When we talk about that holistic idea Mohammed mentioned of the city as an oasis, and basically what we have been doing as designers is very little in a way, right? Yeah. And, and what realtor as a real estate developer, world real estate developer with so many billions is doing in that regard is also very little. Yes. So how we, that ha we have the tools, we understand these things, we can, we can read, we can see. And, and if, we, if we look at the agenda, for example, of Ram Kulas, that has been always trying to anticipate this phenomenon in a way, so even now in this discussion of the countryside, the future, which is now on display at the Guggenheim in, in New York, uh, again, the subject of, is the countryside really a future to solve all this idea of a sustainable community? Even Kulas went to Lagos, Nigeria, and on the face of Lagos, he's not able to publish a book, he's not able to produce knowledge. And I think the big task here is, how can we respond to that? Because what I think is happening with the pandemics is the opposite. Europe is not, Europe is not bringing money to Africa anymore. Uh, people are not looking at Gaza. You know, it's exactly the opposite. Everybody is becoming more confined in their regional environment that Diana was talking about. And, and that somehow loses years and years of what the best globalization has, which is solidarity. Yes. I, I'm not saying that I want to give the, um, my fellow panelists or my colleagues a, a little, uh, like an input in this, but what I want to say is that New York is definitely not the most ideal place to live in, but it is a city and it exists. So the idea is what did New York learn from being in New York and how now every developer needs to put affordable housing, open space to the public and this thing, these kinds of aspects, this is what we will learn while designing these other cities that are more, more that are newer and how we can build let's say, uh, less dense area, but with the mistakes that we learned from building New York so fast and being economically driven. That's what I have. Actually, you are talking about something which might be the role of governments in a way. Another, another I think another discussion Valabi wanted to pull out is this one. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I think, sorry, Sarah, I actually wanted to come and ask you a couple of questions because I think a lot of the things that we're discussing are things we can continue uh, going very deeply in this conversation in. But what's very interesting to understand is that there is honestly a huge interplay between how architecture affects the, you know, government and public policy and the way like the, the dynamics of a successful society. Uh, how do we interact with each other? How do we communicate with each other? How do we interact with buildings? Because a lot of the times, um, as laymen, again, who aren't very involved in and very aware, honestly, of structures and architectures and materials and spaces, we forget um, how they're influencing our behaviors. And I know we've touched upon architecture influencing human behavior. So I think what I kind of want to understand is um, what is really, I mean, perhaps we come back to this, but what I want to understand is there's various changes happening in architecture. You all have been educated in different times. Sara, Mohammed, Salman, you're coming as fairly new graduates into this field of architecture with very different ideas of sustainability. And Dinah and Ricardo, you have perhaps slightly different ideas of the way you've been educated in uh, maybe a couple of decades ago. So what I really want to um, understand is, um, from, from, from my point of view, I think architecture 
plays a huge role in how we start to shape uh, future societies in the most sustainable way. How climate change can be tackled, because that's one of the biggest problems of before this pandemic happened, that was something that was being developed, uh, discussed at the World Economic Forum in Davos. That's something that's being discussed all over the world with the millennial generation that we, we are a part of, right? So, um, so I guess going back to my specific um, question is, Sara, with, uh, with you graduating just pretty much yesterday, what is it that you noticed in your recent discussions in terms of how architecture is going to change and adapt to this, you know, the pandemic, the society, uh, move away? We have talked a little bit about urbanization, but like, what is really the most sustainable way of moving forward? How is it that architecture can play a role in the government in shaping societies? But given all of that, that I'm saying, one more thing I want to add is that I was talking to you yesterday and you mentioned something very interesting to me about it's not sustainable to reshape and rebuild societies, which of course it isn't. So tell me a little bit about, about the concept of adaptive reuse that you mentioned to me yesterday and then share your thoughts on everything. Actually, I, I want to jump into something Ricardo said that I find uh, very inspiring and moving in our time and it's this idea of nationality and nationalism and how that's reacting to the global world. We've lived a decade where globalized things like the supply chain or, you know, people moving from the US to Hong Kong to get jobs done. And uh, similar to manufacturing, that same system of globalization has produced uh, both good and bad. And I think we're reaching a moment right now, whether it's because of social agendas, whether it's our reaction to immigration, whether it's our reaction to pandemics, which um, it's producing a state of mind with which I feel like is gonna run for the next 10 years that goes in reverse to globalization. And that might end up affecting architecture in terms of like what I spoke about earlier um, being supply chain. So, you know, supply chain or even manufacturing, which Ricardo hinted at, like Saudi. Will Saudi manufacture more of its uh, steel panels, more of its construction elements? Will it start to um, produce its cars for police officers? That type of conversation. I think that's super provocative. And I had a question for like while Mohammed was talking that I think I think we've reached a level in population density globally where our reaction to pandemics needs to change. We it's almost inescapable because of how many humans live in the world today that we can solve pandemics by dispersing population across the globe it feels like that's not going to be the solution. Um, so I, I, I guess I pose it to, to you, Mohammed or Ricardo, or anyone that wants to jump in. What is this relationship between the frequency of pandemics, our reactions to pandemics, and the number of human beings in the world? Um. Again, to what I was talking about with my with my pillars and stuff, um, and I think Ricardo touched on it, uh, or I think I don't know if it was Diana or Ricardo. I think no, Diana. Sorry, who was like, uh, you know, washing some streets and stuff. This this is not something you know unheard of before or 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 like too far fetched because you see something. Um, for example, a hundred years ago when the 1918 pandemic happened, New York City was actually at the forefront of having one of the least amount of victims only because the city just kept clean. They kept the citizens in foreign better and people just reacted to it with, with more awareness as opposed to cities like St. Louis or Philadelphia in 1918, which had the highest amount of uh, victims of, of the 1918 flu. Um, and then you flash, flash forward a hundred years later, now New York is, is, is number one. And, and then you read certain things like the New York subway just got washed for the first time in a hundred years. <laughs> this is this is kind of the things that, that, that 
that. that I think that's uh, so it, interesting. It's so interesting because what you're saying is density is not our problem. No, not at all. It's, it's I love okay. that. It's keeping our cities clean. Um, because a lot, a lot of people just live in it. A lot of people are going to be touching handrails. A lot of people are going to be touching doors. So it's it's just natural that that these things need to need to be thought of again more clearly. Not just yeah, like post uh, COVID nineteen. This needs to continue happening. Um, and and education. It's it's where does your food come? Uh, is it is it organic? Is it been go, gone through some sort of inspection? Um, and again, not tampering with nature, staying in a, in a dense environment where you have a, a, a population that is aware, that is conscious that, that certain things can get bad if they're not attended to quickly. I would just ask one thing, sorry, Valali, just because I think this is an interesting moment here, because Mohammed just raised one thing uh, and a subject, which is, either Saad and Mohammed, they were talking about things they see eventually because they are architects or they are urban planners. So it's a very, it's a very, it's a very specific uh, practice that is equipped in a, in, a, in a way that eventually is not being maximized in terms of use by the overall good in a way. And, and, and somehow I think this crisis calls architects for more roles because when, when he's talking about the material of the subway, we are not only talking about cleaning, we are talking about maintenance plans and eventually architects are very good at understanding plans and understand how this maintenance can be scheduled. Uh, we are also talking about materials and eventually architects are very good at understanding how materials can change. So somehow, again, we are always talking about what can architects do more than what they do now because at the moment everybody thinks that we are just able to design houses. And I think this is what is inspiring in what Diana was talking about. And, and also on, on what somehow Valabi uh, teased Salman with, which is somehow to understand what can be the contribution of, of an architect's mindset in all this idea of a capital-driven world of real estate. And I, I, I would like to hear more Salman on that. If, if I, I, want, if I, I want to say something. I yeah. love Mohammed's shirt. Because it's a message. <laughs> and it says the war on cars to reduce carbon emission. And we live in a less, uh, less, let's say, unsustainable environment. I specifically chose to wear what I'm wearing now, which is the Saudi, which is the Saudi dress for the men, to, for a reason. Because I'm in Saudi Arabia and we, wear, we wore it in the past for a reason, which is it reduces the, uh, the, uh, the heat of the sun, which is uh, aware, being aware of the environment, and ventilation to, to control and comfort the body temperature. Now, we are all faced with coronavirus. Us, what we can do but with what we wear and with the messages that we do in order to prevent a such case to happen again or to make uh, it less severe, number one, for example, I, I think that there will be a lot of uh, things that we don't necessarily need to touch, they will be eliminated. Whoever said that we need to touch the elevator button every time we touch? Because we know already, we know the nature of the, this thing, that it doesn't spread, it spreads by touching and it, sp it spreads by air. So, or from the air droplets, if you're close to someone. So we will always be able to stay six away, like far from each other. And we can always also try to reduce the touch points. Like when you walk into a building, are, are, do you have to touch the door of the building? Everybody needs to open the building with the door or is it an easy fix to have an auto, uh, automatic door? But, this but Salman, you know that because you are a designer and every time you are selecting or specifying an elevator or a door, you think about those things. And this, this was my point. Eventually, yes. the people that just use it uh, and talking now about human behavior that Valabi mentioned before, they, they just use it. They don't question. But you are the one who knows but that. Professor, now when they use it, they use it with their elbows because they're aware of the virus. So there are situations that we as human beings intuitively start doing and designers are going are gonna, to uh, implement it in their designs. Do you, like, there are infrastructure, design infrastructure, uh, that, that not is only infrastructure in the sense of transportation, 
but rather in a sense of every single detail around you is going to be trauma as a result of COVID-19, trauma, the trauma of COVID-19. I us, think, sorry to interrupt you. I, I just think that this is a good way for Valabi to take us to the last point, which is getting inside buildings. <laughs> because I, I think we have been around <laughs> buildings. We are all architects. And uh, Valabi <laughs> wanted to make a challenge to all of us. Yeah, no. Uh, and I think this is exactly... Salman, you took us exactly to the right point. Since we are opening the door, let's go in. I am so grateful that you're here with me, Ricardo, because I am a person who struggles to interrupt people. And yes, there is an agenda that I am. I'm sorry. Right? I'm sorry. I'm very, no, I'm I, very I, bad I don't, at that. Please don't, be, <laughs> don't, don't apologize, because if you hadn't done that, I, I, would st I can hear Salman speak for hours, you know? So, but that's not efficient for everybody's listening in on this conversation. So, so I guess, yeah, thank you for that. But uh, Salman, based on everything that you said, and yeah, it's true. I've heard you speak before and like I'm enamored by all of the things that he speaks about with a passion he speaks about architecture in general. So it's amazing. But I really wanted to discuss a couple of things today and we have touched on a lot of those. But things that we haven't talked about uh, that I would like to talk about are the role of technology in architecture. And I will get into that. But also, you know, if we have time, you know, the application of all of these various concepts that we are discussing right now, what is the practical application of it in the concept of um, uh, buildings at the moment that are most relevant for all of us, which are hospitals and perhaps spiritual and religious spaces? those are the two areas that uh, before we really conclude our argument like our discussion I want to get into that so talking about technology I think I want to I I have noticed technology has affected all of the industries across the board so and an architecture being one of them so I think over I think uh, something I'd like to share with all of you is that when I started, when we started really having these discussions, the first discussion that we had with one of my professors uh, from Parsons, Kaleem, he's back actually, is the concept of asynchronous design. And that's a very new concept that's been applied within the field of uh, engineering and computer science. And it is a concept that I personally still struggle to understand completely. But from what I understand, the idea is that Typically, we are used to um, used to using, for instance, we are, Salman, you and I would communicate on WhatsApp and WhatsApp only. But now with this pandemic, with COVID, we are tapping into various technologies such as we are sometimes FaceTiming, we're using Zoom, we're going on, uh, we're uh, tapping into VR for the world of architects. So we're tapping into various design uh, uh, tools and uh, uh, that are available to us. So we're actually communicating in a very asynchronous way, which is a very non-chronological, very different way of communication that has arised and become, that has evolved because of the pandemic. You know, we are communicating, no, no one used Zoom to this extent before. No one used, I mean, we had all these technologies, they always existed, but the use of it was not to this extent. So given all of that background, within the field of architecture, um, how are you envisioning the use of technology within your space? How is it actually bringing people closer together with from different countries? Because architecture translates across borders, right? So um, um, Salman, I will ask you that about, uh, share your thoughts on how concepts of telecommuting Virtuals, you know, virtual virtual communication has affected your work. Well, that's that's a great question. It's 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 been uh, the telecommunication has been ex ex uh, it was existing in the field since I was working at HOK in two thousand and fourteen, where I was asked to work to, uh, with the, my design team to design a dis a creative sustainable district in the eastern province in Saudi Arabia. So we connected Washington DC, was the, who, who was a which was a branch of HOK, and San Francisco, California. We had Saudi Aramco, which was the, who, who was which were our client in Saudi Arabia, and we were able to come together in order to to come and design a whole district of six million 
uh, square meters. So that existed since 2014. Going back to the beginning of this conversation, coronavirus just put the full speed and nitro on this. And I think that the technology is at full speed and pedal to the floor. And I think that people are going to work day and night just to increase the ability of, of telecommunication between the designer and the client and in every aspect of the economy. And I think we will have new technology. I'm a true believer of the evolutionary of evolution and the technology is a part of us now. And I think that it, not, it will only evolve and at a full speed in order for us to survive and prosper in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would hope so, honestly. But, that, you know, Dana and Sara, Sara, because you just graduated, I want to know from your point of view that what is it that in the last few weeks or the last couple of months you noticed that Colombia was talking a lot about the use of technology in collaboration. And Diana, because you're actually practically involved in a lot of these, you know, you're, you're literally communicating and your project is involved. You're working from Rhode Island all the way in a school in uh, Nepal and in India. So please, both of you, we can start with you, Diana, comment on, comment on all of this um, and your use of tech. Well, there's, um, there's this kind of incredible uh, uh, yeah, divide between, you know, in, in India, I'm literally working in the middle of the desert at very, it, it can get 120 degrees, the sand can start, you know, to, whatever, knocking you over. And I, we use ArchiCAD and we have these, uh, I bring iPads with me and I bring to these people who live very primitively, who are really truly master craftsmen. And then I'll walk them through the building on my iPad and they're just like, never seen anything like this. They're just like, it's like a little video game and they can interact with it. And it's actually an incredible tool to show them three dimensionally what I'm trying to do because the problem in a lot of these, you know, it, it, it happens in the United States, it happens everywhere, but is the translation of a drawing to the actual built environment is, and is one of our biggest challenges and is sort of an impossibility. So that's been really amazing and to sort of see their delight in like, you know, you virtually move through the space and here you are, you know, we're 30 miles from the city, which is even a very remote, primitive, not primitive, but the city. So that has been one thing. The other thing for us that's been kind of amazing just recently is actually Facebook, which seems like a very strange thing. But I will post pictures of the building and I get like all of these people who will respond and say, can I send my daughter to your school? Do you have anyone who will buy this wedding vestment for us? Like it's a very direct connection that is because of technology and because there's a thread that's been broken down and so they feel comfortable. I mean, some of the questions are a little off, but like, comfortable actually interacting and we've as a result we've started signing up hundreds of girls and hundreds of women for the women's center and um that's been uh, i mean a completely unexpected yeah. um development i mean we actually thought chaitanya was going to be able to be getting these people i think they're actually like <laughs> it's a huge challenge to get uh, any kind of uh, enrollment for the, the project that Diana is working on is, is a very, very difficult project because the, the region of Jaisalmer, Rajasthan it has not had women or, I mean, it has, uh, from what my friend Chaitanya has told me, there has been, no one's been married for the last 100 years. So you can understand that the density of the population, there's, there's too many men and there's not enough women. And then on top of that, all the women are just hiding in these homes. So when this school was built, 
suddenly, yeah, a lot of parents, because of uh, the efforts of Dinah and her team, and the, the organization that she works closely with, and Chaitanya, they really had to do grassroots effort into really getting these girls to go to school. So it's like a very, it's a very good cause, but sorry, Dinah, you're saying something? There's a very, very high rate of female infanticide there. And so, yeah. Which that's is not a problem, yeah. So, <laughs> so. I miss that, yeah, but it's, it's uh, I mean, incredible work that all of you are doing there. But, uh, uh, Sarah, I'm going to let you chime in on this as well, but also more, I want to understand from your perspective, working for the government, how are you, you really using technology in terms of the mobility and like, you know, how are your teams working in Bahrain? So Sarah, let's, uh, let's start with you and then Mo, we'll go into your, your perspective. Sure. Um, that was a very provocative story, Diana. That seems like very engaging work. Um, I guess for me personally, what I wear because of my personal interests, I think the idea of manufacturing and digital technologies and how that's changing the idea of the craftsperson. I think the architect is also moving into the factory in the sense architects are craftspeople. The only issue is, is that we've been separated due to digital technologies like AutoCAD from the act of construction. So I think with either it's like 3D printing or CNCing, um, we're seeing a greater relationship between architects and their craft. And I think it's an exciting, exciting opportunity because it means our cities will not all look the same. And I definitely urge all architects to not think of their profession as solely in an office that does architecture, but maybe it is in a factory where you design products for architects to use in the future. Um, I think that's, that's definitely my passion, my passion in architecture. And I see that relating a lot to technology. Yeah, that's incredible. Mo, Mo would you like to add to that? Yes. Um, so all day today, I've been like researching a past pandemics, 1918, the Black Death and whatever, and, and seeing how uh, governments and authorities have been re reacted to them in the past. And at the pandemic of 1918, 100 years ago, like police would actually get physically violent. They would throw people in jail if they were to um, uh, disobey the social distancing and quarantine. Uh, laws that were set in place here in Bahrain, they've been really aggressive and in my opinion, in a good way of trying to contain the virus as much as possible. The government launched an app that you put in your ID and your address and it will, sh it, it will alert you if someone around you has been tested positive. If you ask this question for someone in the more very liberal part in the US, they'll see this as an invasion of privacy. I personally think it's a good thing. It, like, it's, I, I want to know, like if, if someone close to me is positive, like I want to know. Um, an even more extreme measure is, is um, a lot of, uh, the first cases, how it got to Bahrain was through, uh, from people flying in from abroad. So uh, I think a few weeks ago, they started giving anyone who comes in from the airport some sort of a plastic tracker that they need to keep on them for two weeks so that they know that the person does not leave the, their house. So they're enforcing uh, um, social distancing and quarantining very hard, which in my opinion is really helping uh, isolate the, and contain the, the virus. Uh, some people might think it's a lot, but I, think it is a step in the right direction. It is, it is um, aggressive, but in my opinion, necessary. So in terms of, of, of technology, the government has been really, really active in getting apps created, trackers created, just to really, really try to contain this as, as quickly as possible. Right. I think, I think, I think it was, was very provocative the way how, how everyone was tackling the subject. Uh, I, I think at a, at a certain extent, uh, we should try to wrap up the discussion. Yeah. Uh, we have been here for one hour and, a, and 40 minutes. Uh, I think it uh, would, be, would be really interesting 
and eventually taking the lead on this idea of of the impact on building, which which somehow we already uh, quite discussed without getting exactly inside. But I think would be would be very interesting just in a last round of questions, if Valadi allows me to uh, to know a little bit more of what Diana thinks the impact of many of the issues we discussed, not properly the pandemics, but many of the issues from material condition to uh, tracking that Mohammed mentioned, to this, this idea of somehow a certain relation with the capital and the territory that Salman was mentioning. How do you think this will affect healthcare, uh, somehow distribution all over the territory? Uh, this idea of smaller, bigger hospitals, smaller clinics, larger hospitals. I think this has been an issue, for example, in New York during these days, as well as, for example, in, in Texas, where I just heard that many of the small hospitals were not able to have ventilators. So, and for that, they were not able to respond to the pandemics, for example. And this, this actually goes back to Mohammed's claims of, of, of a city, of a proper city, uh, being well equipped, uh, and this idea of efficiency. Uh, on, on the other hand, I think it would be also interesting to understand from, from Salman, uh, this uh, especially, how religious spaces or practices might evolve. And, and, and this is something that is exactly at the center of real estate move in Saudi Arabia. Real estate has been much more liberal, let's say, in Saudi Arabia when we talk about Mecca and Medina than anything else. And I think there will be a change. To, to learn about and to know where the real estate sector will move and how we'll deal with, with religion in a way. Uh, the same thing I would say to, to Mohammed that, that somehow uh, the, the relation with the mosque and, and, and a little bit going back to this human behavior, the habits and traditions, right? So how do you basically live in a city with a certain routine of prayers and, and how that somehow as an impact on the, on the city dynamics. And, and finally, I would go back to Sara and understand and, and touch on this idea of the architect moving inside the, the fabrication industry and, and how somehow spaces like hospitals and, and healthcare spaces that require this sort of hygienization can be uh, typologies for exploration uh, of this sort of new notion of, of block or unit that could be fabricated. This, this has been always something in and out. How can you build a building made out of components that are somehow modular, that are pre-made, and how that sort of product making that Sara was talking about in factory can become space making, right? So how you can evolve from the product developer into a module, so modular construction developer in the factory. And, and eventually we can start by Eliana and then go on the order that I mentioned. Okay, that was a lot, but um, I would have to agree with Mohammed very much that the, um, the mindset that I've seen in India, because I've been following that very closely, and the mindset in the United States are just completely different. You know, we are so offended by anybody following our movements. And it's and it's it's a concept that we need to move forward with. We need to get over. Like it has to we all need to understand that this is something that affects all of us. And blaming and you know all of that is just really non-productive. And um, I think that there has to be a breakdown in many ways of borders and these ideas of like intense nationalism and, and fear of, of the other and fear of, I mean, I experienced it when I was in India. They, we would walk through places and everybody would basically leave because they saw us as foreigners who had the coronavirus. And it's just, it was sort of an interesting shift. But I, um, I really think that Americans need to, to have a more global attitude towards being tracked, being responsible, standing up and saying, yes, I have this and I don't want to spread it. And I, and I think that, that if there's some way that we could come together, the global leaders could come together in a more powerful way, I think that that would 
help. And then the, you know, the, the to me, the biggest problem is this income distribution, which is, is disparity rather that is so profound. And it's, the coronavirus has affected the less fortunate in, in such a more profound way than, than is necessary. And the people who have, it's so easy for those of us in these developed countries to give so little that would make huge shifts. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Yeah. Salman. I, th I, I believe that the idea of, um, of, of Sarah's idea of adaptive reuse will be looked into more. Okay, when you're designing a certain program of architecture or building, how can it be served if a certain, pan if this pandemic hits again? Or if anything, well, how can it serve for a different purpose? This is number one. Number two, what are the products that Sarah also mentioned that architects can think can enable these type of buildings to succeed and for these type of buildings to be functional. For example, I think that combines both. My twin brother, Sultan, he did his master's research to create drone tower distribution center. So are we gonna be needing a drone tower distribution center in the future that distributes packages for in case we cannot leave our house whatsoever with a mask, without mask, and the pandemic is so strong that, okay, can we receive our food without human interaction? So these type of questions can, let's say the Olympics is coming up. But, can, but tell me one thing, tell me one thing, Salman. In Mecca, where somehow your stronger beliefs, you know, at a certain point, your religious integrity is higher than anything we are here discussing. So, uh, and I imagine the challenge of, of a Ramadan period, of aid, all this without the experience of going into Mecca. And uh, this might, might be a trap, you know, for many people. Eventually, among us, there is a sort of a liberal understanding of religion that where, where that might not be uh, the case. But for many people, uh, Mecca is the center of the world. And it's the place where I learn how to live, where I learn the conditions of my life. The mosque is the holy place where I, ha I am protected, where I feel protection. So... How, how, how drones will solve this no, issue I, I think, or no, he respond to this? I think, Professor, that drones is part of another issue, which is delivering food and, and reducing uh, the, the social interaction. But you mentioned something called, when you said product that creates a space. So like Sarah mentioned, like these architectural products, like thermometers at the entrance of mosques, the advancements of testing at the entrance, uh, entrance of mosques, we are currently living in a pandemic, but this pandemic will go away. But people will need reassurance if the mosque has a, or Mecca or any mosque has a thermal uh, thermostat at the door of the mosque and testing, let's say, for the region around it, people will feel more comfortable to enter when, or more comfortable to, un to re uh, to, to re-enter these, these areas. So, so you agree with Mohammed that somehow technology should be perceived as a way to innate trust among exactly, each other. Yes. So this is exactly present. Yeah. In the future, this, the virus will not be there. But how so, can we create product and a product and infrastructure that in case a more serious virus comes that might be a true threat to humanity and our existence on this planet, if it's more fatal and more, let's say this is already a, very contagious, how, do we have the infrastructure as the drone tower to distribute the food? If we, if we were able to... Sure, sure, sure. How can you anticipate that? But, yeah. but I, think, I think here would be interesting, Mohammed, if you can tell us more about how these will affect routines and especially those routines that affect your, your life standards, your quotidian. Uh, to answer that, I have to call something Diana said very early on, which kind of shook me, which is the, sh the reshifting of how people think about cities and how people might actually not want to be in cities anymore which for an urban planner, that's a nightmare scenario. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, when I think of what, 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 what that means is I immediately think of, of big cities in the States in the late 50s and 60s when cars just started becoming popular. People 
you know, ran to the suburbs and cities just literally started to decay. And for a lot of cities, true, that could happen, but by means of having necessary infrastructure, at the top of that right now are hospitals. And not to pick on the US, but I'm gonna pick on the US, and that's, and that's the main problem right now that they're facing is um, the, the lack of having enough hospitals no one has health care. Uh, 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 you have nurses and doctors quitting left and right because they just don't have the proper equipment and safety gear. And that's incredibly sad. Where you see as here, for example, not to say that I live in heaven or anything, but, but, but it's just, it's, it's the way nurses are being taken care of, the way doctors are being taken care of. You have the government providing them with, the, you know, temporary housing just so they can be temporarily isolated from their own family so that they don't, they don't spread the virus. Their personal debts are being taken care of. They're, they're really being um, put on a pedestal because they deserve it. And, and it's, 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 it's uh, their jobs to take care of people. And it's, it's, it's rethinking um, to include more of these kinds of infrastructure because without them, then I, then I absolutely agree. No one will want to live in a city where there's not enough hospitals or schools or, or if, the, if the air isn't clean enough. So there is kind of like that shift happening, uh, depending whether the, it's a, on the good side or bad side. It's, it's rethinking where you live uh, um, and the infrastructure around you, which is it's very scary and interesting at the same time. So everybody wants to run away from religious questions, I think. We, can, we should go to Sare and then, and then Valavi, Valavi should wrap up with Niti. I'll let, you, I'll let you say some final thoughts before I can chime in. I think the religious question is very funny because also in the US there was apparently some church somewhere refused to acknowledge that coronavirus was happening and they continued their sermons and then I think seven cases came out of one, one day of celebration. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a complex question to talk about the idea of collective space and how pandemics may influence them. Because essentially, religious space is collective space. Um, I don't think we will ever, as social hu humans, move away from collective space. We'll just find ways to mitigate our interaction with them. Um, but as to like your question about uh, modularity, and construction elements. Uh, obviously, we've seen Javits Center in New York and how the use of hospital beds and inflatable corridors and whatever um, have proven positive. I think my personal take on modularity is this idea that, you know, in many ways, architects have pushed for modularity in construction, especially in housing units, but still have not ingrained themselves in the production of them. It's like, I guess I'm reiterating myself again. Um, my issue with modularity is its sense of uniformity. And I think that is due to its distance from the act of design. Um, so I think if there is a reconnection between the act of design and the act of creating these large structural modules uh, use, one thing I did a research, I mean, big big a lot of my a lot of my interest is really construction and modularity and and this but one of them was motorhomes motorhomes are an insane opportunity for architects that we're just like completely disregarding you know it's like these spaces is a form of living, but then you see people like Warren Buffett taking advantage of these motor homes and creating really crappy designs. So, um, yeah, that would be my two, two cents. Well, Sara, I think uh, I missed you a little bit over there in, in, in the end, but I think, um, you know, before I even end, Ricardo, I'm going to let you just say, so say a few words and then I'll finally try to wrap this entire discussion up which has almost been close to two hours. So thank you for bringing that up. But let you say some final words and anyone else who wants to. Um, and then we're going to wrap up. 
I think I already talked too much and, and already cut a lot, cut a lot, cut a lot on Salman. I would give my minutes to Salman, uh, and and uh, and I would. Uh, I think I think it's it's it's. We touched on many subjects. I think your uh, structure of Valabi was very ambitious. We were going into many areas of of discussion, and I understand that's that's something typical from someone that is not within the field. So not being an architect, you thought that we could talk in a very simple way about all this range of things, which, which our architects are not able to. And I think one of the, I would just finalize saying that one of the problems we have as architects on being more involved on everything else and being more requested by others is trying to synthesize, trying to be more able to communicate. We are very complex in the way we communicate everything. So for the world to value our ideas and the way we see the world, we need to be better at doing that. And being better at doing that is being able to produce data, being able to rationalize issues that for others are simpler than what they think. So, so I would just add that. And, I, I, and since you were talking about technology and about the several means of communication, I think it's, it's very interesting how Diana said that Facebook can become some sort of public square or parliament because people interact in a different way, while Instagram is more a display of images, while Zoom is another thing. So I, I really hope that a new generation understands these tools as ways to communicate, not only with clients, but to, with the world out there. Yeah. Uh, well, Ricardo, I think, yes, I'm gonna own up to it. Uh, coming from a completely outsider's perspective and all of you uh, have, bring very unique perspectives into this entire discussion. You know, Sara, with your thoughts on like all, all the various concepts you really brought to our attention that I, I can speak for everybody, we do not understand, you know, uh, and more your concept of urbanization, your experience working with the Bahrain government, Diana, your experiences within India, Nepal, India. I mean, like, from luxury to nonprofit, and like, you know, Salman, also your experience that related. And then all of these concepts, honestly, are just blowing my mind away. And yes, I will honestly, yeah, I, it's true that I think I had a very ambitious plan of discussing various topics today. And surely we've yet again only scratched the surface because this has happened in the previous round tables uh, with, with me as well that we've only been able to scratch the surface of a lot of these different concepts. I think we, uh, the intention was also to, to get into um, some ideas of the, con that there's a city in India, Chandigarh, which Ricardo and I talked very deeply about, uh, Professor Kaleem and I have talked about, uh, about so many times, and it's a very interesting concept that I really wanted to talk about within this round table, but we never got to it. I wanted to talk a lot, a lot more deeply about the concept of tele telecommunicating with all of you guys. We didn't get to that. So there's a lot of things that we did not get to, but the idea is that for, for me, it was an interesting, um, you know, understanding to just kind of hear your thoughts, what you're passionate about, what are the things that are happening in the world of architecture and like for all of us to really understand that architecture really plays a huge role in how we interact with each other, how we communicate with each other. It also plays a huge role in how our cultures are built over tens and tens, 20, 30 years, you know. So that's something we, we didn't get into, but also the feasibility of all of the things and concepts you're discussing. Because um, Sara, something you and I talked about just yesterday with the adaptive reuse is that there's lots of buildings that already exist. So in order to make them more sustainable, you can't just start building things from scratch. You're going to really have to repurpose the way things will get restructured. So all of the, so you know, the feasibility of that from a financial perspective, um, from a cultural perspective, so there's a lot more to be discussed. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that we have scratched the surface of lots of different topics. And I am grateful to all five of you for sharing your thoughts, your ideas with all of us. And um, I am really just starting this initiative out. So I appreciate the patience. I appreciate the, the patience in specifics to how 
there is a structure, but there's also a lot, lack of structure to these conversations. And going forward, I think we'll figure that out. Um, and we're going to figure that out with all of you. I'm going to obviously be troubling pretty much every single one of you a lot now to, dis to figure out what's the call to action. How can we collaborate? How can we connect? How are all of you perhaps you know going to connect with each other because that's my my goal so with all of that said um i guess i want to end on that and i want to say that i'm so incredibly grateful to all of you uh this has one been one of the most diverse panels for all of us because you we're literally in six different countries i mean sorry five different countries diana and sara are in the same place but yeah um and thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I am going to let all of you say anything if you want to add, um, but most likely we're going to need a follow-up discussion. So I hope you're all thank ready. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Val. It you. was an honor and a pr privilege to be uh, among you guys, especially Sara, that I, I lo always looked up to, and without saying Professor Camacho, and um, <laughs> it was a really honor to meet, it was a real honor to meet Mohammed as well, really. It was a privilege, and Diana as well, of course. Likewise. <laughs> I think you have Thank to do a duania du or a fireplace. You know, I have two twin brothers <laughs> in Dubai that every Thursday we have a fireplace through Zoom. And I can tell you that the discussion flows quite, <laughs> quite nicely. So every Thursday we know that someone comes in and out. And, <laughs> and normally the crowd is also coming from different countries, you know, from, from Japan to U.S., you have different people coming in. And that, that's actually a very interesting model of, of Zoom meeting because it's again. It's great that you, you know what's a diwani and what's our culture as <laughs> professors. You, know, you understand us and you're welcome anytime. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. This was very engaging and fun. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for all our attendees who are still here. It's been two hours into this discussion. So we are all very appreciative that you're here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Lots of thank yous. Um, and we'll, we'll probably be in touch in regards to where we're going next with this discussion. So goodbye, good night, and thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.